Welcome back. If you're just joining us, this is The Big Ten with yours truly, Nina Shaban. Let the countdown continue. Banks will soon be on the spot on how they assess the eligibility of individual borrowers' access to credit. The governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, that's Dr. Patrick Jaroge, um, has directed all commercial banks to formulate a model that will allow or rather be used to assess borrowers and make lending decisions. The CBK governor's call came a day after the CBK's Monetary Policy Committee lowered the CBK's benchmark lending rate to its lowest level in nine years at 8.25 percent. In November 2019, President Uhuru Kenyatta signed into law the Finance Bill 2019 that, among other provisions, repealed Section 33B of the Banking Act, which provided for capping of bank interest rates. Although the removal of the rate caps was aimed to enhance access to credit, especially by private sector, and cut off exploitative lenders, it was not lost on many that borrowers would have to once again face commercial banks in order to take out loans. In a bid to cushion borrowers from the risk of being exposed to expensive loans, the central bank has in the last two months lowered its policy benchmark lending rate twice to the current level of 8.25%. While this is intended to be a signal to banks to lower their lending rates, the CBK wants commercial banks to give a clear indication of how they intend to extend credit going forward. We do not expect some sort of random, uh, let's say, model, you know, where they say, okay, this is a, for instance, how is it that they are going to, uh, to assess that this individual has a certain risk profile? I mean, it cannot be a random number. It cannot be a random, uh, let's say, model that does that. So it has to be a robust model. Um, so we don't want just, uh, just to throw it back into a black box. I hope we understand what this is. This is important uh, because that's really where everything will stand or fall. Although CBK has not issued a deadline for the plan, the CBK boss is optimistic that a plan will be ready within the first quarter of this year. At this moment, I cannot tell you that uh, Bank X has finished and Bank Y, we have yet to start. Um, but obviously, what we have generally done is to be a bit more risk-based. We tend to be risk-based. So you begin with the large ones, um, or maybe you test it with the small ones and then go to the big ones. So you Another issue of concern to the CBK is the volume of pending bills by the national government which were largely blamed for slowed economic growth last year with bills amounting to 58.2 billion shillings. According to CBK, all pending bills dating back five years have been cleared as at January 23rd. The national government has virtually cleared all its pending bills. Okay, And these are the current ones we are talking, current. It's true there are some historical pending bills which are being looked at uh, by a multi-agency um, team. So a team that, will be, that has been assigned specifically to go look at the, his, the old historical things because you never know, there could be a lot of maneno in, in, in those things. But counties are, however, yet to clear most of their pending bills to suppliers. Pending bills have particularly dealt a big blow to the ability of borrowers to repay their loans, a situation that resulted in a growing number of loan defaulters. For instance, defaults on home loans alone hit a 38 billion shillings as at November last year, according to the Kenya Bankers Association. So far, 7 billion shillings worth of non-performing loans have been recovered as efforts to recover more loans continue. The government is also realigning its borrowing to focus more on local and longer-dated treasury bonds. CBK governor has indicated that government targets to borrow 300.3 billion shillings domestically. Now, the Central Bank of Kenya is overly optimistic that the Kenya's economy is on an upward growth this year following reforms and policies, especially in the agriculture sector and the microeconomic sector that will drive the economy to a growth of 6.2%. However, it is advising government to spend the money wisely and not invest in substandard projects. You'll see schools that are half finished, right? Uh, you'll see clinics that... You know, maybe they are finished because they have a roof, but uh, they don't have windows, they don't have, I mean, 
let's let's we can even I just now was thinking of other projects, you know, the Waiyaki, no, it's, what is it called, Raira Road, not Raira Road, it's, uh, <laughs> what is it called, I'm sorry, this, you need to delete certain things, right? Red Hill Road, isn't that what it's, Red Hill to Waiyaki Way, yeah. yesterday the wall collapsed. The CBK governor remarks come nearly a fortnight after the International Monetary Fund indicated that half of the ongoing 1,000 projects have stalled, saying that the stalled projects will require 1 trillion shillings to be completed. The IMF observed that there has been a rapid increase in public investment since 2010, which has occurred without enough screening for project viability and readiness before they entered the budget. Victoria Amunga for Metropol TV, Nairobi. Hand in hand with that, weak corporate governance has been cited as one of the biggest contributors to the rising volume of non-performing loans among savings and credit cooperatives. According to experts at the Metropole Institute of Credit Management, managers in circles have largely failed to adopt systematic approaches to analyze prospective borrowers before issuing loans. Meanwhile, East African Cables on Wednesday announced that it is in the process of restructuring nearly a fifth of its debts. In a statement published in the local dailies, the cable manufacturing firm said it has been in talks with all its lenders and had successfully completed the restructure of 82% of its bank loans. The listed company father said it made, that it made what it terms as significant progress to complete the restructuring of the remaining debts, which include a loan it owes SBM Bank. The, st the statement came two days after SBM Bank announced that it had filed a petition in the High Court to wind up the firm. Through its lawyers, Robinson, Robson, Harris and company advocates, the bank indicated that the petition will be mentioned in court next Tuesday on the 4th of January 2020. The petition to liquidate East African Cables was filed last week on the 22nd of January 2020. As of December 2018, the company's current liabilities stood at 4.4 billion shillings, four times its current assets, which stood at 1.1 billion shillings. And since 2014, East African Cables has shed nearly 84% of its value. Now, East African Cables is the latest company to join the list of companies that are facing liquidation, Nakumet Supermarkets being one of them, uh, one of the prominent firms, actually, that are on the verge of being liquidated. So what is liquidation and what are the legal grounds that warrant liquidation of a companies? To discuss this and other questions, I had a sit down with um, Ian Kageri Mbugwa, an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. Let's listen in. So East African Cables is the latest company to join the list of companies that are facing liquidation. Nakumet Supermarkets are being one of the prominent firms that are on the verge of being liquidated. So what is liquidation and what are the legal grounds that warrant liquidation of a company? To discuss this and other questions, I'm joined by Kagerian Bugwa, an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. A very good evening to you, Kagerian. Evening, Yena. How are you doing? Uh, very well. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence. I'd mm -hmm. like us to start off with um, what exactly is liquidation within the context of insolvency? Uh, liquidation is just one facet of the practice of insolvency in mm -hmm. that it is a process by which a company's affairs are wound up mm -hmm. or, uh, as, as, as the word puts it, by saying they're liquidated, you basically mean that you'd convert the assets of the company mm -hmm. to their money's worth mm -hmm. with a view to settling the company's liability. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, liquidation is the ultimate or is the last option when it comes to insolvency practice. Mm -hmm. uh, developing, you can give us a bigger picture on yeah, insolvency. Of course. Developing jurisprudence in the country right now or our legal system right now, in fact, looks at liquidation as a last resort what the courts emphasize on or what the judicial system in Kenya right now emphasizes mm -hmm. on is administration. Okay. Administration is a process where uh, the law tries to maintain the organization as a going concern long enough for it to be able to repay its mm -hmm. debt or to meet its liabilities. Mm -hmm. It is only until an organization gets to a point where it is proved and presented to the court that even if it is maintained, and even if it continues running, it can never mm. be able to recover 
long enough or perform well enough to be able to meet its liability. Mm -hmm. Then the option of liquidation comes in. Mm -hmm. a, a good example is uh, Nakumat, because Nakumat was granted its first orders of administration, I believe, in January of 2018. Mm -hmm. And since then, now the, the, there is an effect that comes with uh, orders of administration being granted. Mm -hmm. Because once administration <coughs> is granted by the court, it means that you can't sue the company. Mm -hmm. And for example, landlords cannot uh, evict uh, that particular company from any premises that they hold. Mm -hmm. This is meant to give the company a bit of breathing space for it to be able to regroup, maybe come up with a different strategy to, with a view to bring it back to profitability so that it can be able now to meet its liabilities. Mm -hmm. But again, I'll use the case of Nakumat because <clears throat> it's been the most dominant and most recent case until it got to a point where they had to let go of all their branches because one of the other retailers bought them out. They had six branches left. Naivas came and bought them out. So they no longer have a business to run. And so the last time the matter was in court, I believe was two weeks ago, uh, the administrator is now in the process of winding up the organization. Okay, now that you've mentioned that, what exactly is the guards, um, the shareholders or directors of a company um, when it comes to, when it, the creditor files a petition to liquidate the company? Now, uh, ideally what happens is there are certain, well, once, once a company is undergoing the process of insolvency, the law tries to prioritize certain creditors first. Remember, even shareholders and directors are creditors to the company yeah. because they contribute initial nominal share capital to the organization. So even in the event of liquidation, they're supposed to be paid back the amounts that they contributed into the organization. But <clears throat> the law places a certain emphasis on what we call secured creditors. Secured creditors are, for example, like banks, because they have given credit to the organization, and as a bond for that credit, the company either attached its property, or uh, it's, it's either real estate property, or the company's assets, other, other assets of the company. So those, are, th those creditors are given priority. Uh, unfortunately, the guys at the lower ebb of uh, the creditors are suppliers, for example. Mm -hmm. But you, of course, have to take into consideration government mm -hmm. in terms of KRA, uh, which is also now also becomes or becomes enjoined as a creditor as well. Landlords are also pretty high up because they are very critical to helping the company turn around its operations. But shareholders and directors, in as far as they contributed to the initial capital of the organization, are also looked at as creditors. Unfortunately, what happens is, as is the case, for example, with Nakumat, when the company is liquidated and uh, whatever money is realized from that entire process, mm -hmm. it is up to, in this case, the administrator, or in the case of a liquidation, a liquidator, to distribute whatever sums are realized yeah. to try and satisfy the debt that is there as best as they possibly Of course, it cannot meet the entire debt, but they try to distribute it as best as they can mm. to make sure at least, according to <coughs> that rank and order of priority, the creditors at least are, get something out All of right. the process. Okay. Now, in the case of the East African, uh, East Africa cables, what are the implica implications, actually, of liquidating a publicly quoted company? Like it's a listed company. Mm. Well, you know, I was actually listening to the story going on, and I remember there's a time their share price was about 700 shillings for a share. They had to split their shares. Now it's closing at two shillings. Yes. So that's really sad. But <coughs> this is a prime example, actually, as to why the law in Kenya has taken the option of prioritizing administration over liquidation. Because you realize when you're dealing with a publicly listed company, there are so many people who have contributed towards that company. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the judicial system, and we can even, I hope we'll get a chance to review this maybe after the matter is mentioned in court once or twice, will not be quick to liquidate. The first option will be, and I can tell you, Rob Sonaris are going to make applications for administration before mm -hmm. court, because that protects the company's assets. That makes sure that no one can go to court without the permission of either the court that grants the orders of administration mm -hmm. or the administrator himself. Now, the administrator comes in and is actually at a, higher, at, at a higher level than the directors because the directors become what we call, um, uh, they, they basically become defunct. 
and all authority to act on behalf of the company is vested on the administrator. So now he's supposed to figure out how to turn the company around. And that, I can predict, is what is going to happen with this matter as well. Are, are there any legal timelines? Yes. Um, when you talk about liquidation, now at, at the end, liquidation should take a year, 12 months. That's a period that's stipulated uh, under the law. And if it exceeds the period of 12 months, then the liquidator mm -hmm. is supposed to call a general meeting of the company within three months and is supposed to present the accounts uh, of the organization. Mm -hmm. So this is how much has been realized so far. This is how much of the company's liabilities have been met so far. And if it needs more time, then that is also supposed to be ventilated at that same meeting. Okay. The same accounts are also supposed to be launched with the register of companies <coughs> uh, because the register of companies needs to be aware of what is going on uh, with the organization. Mm -hmm. Administration also will normally be granted for 12 months. Within the 12 months, the administrator is supposed to have called for a creditors meeting okay. where now he presents a strategy and of course presents a proposal to the creditors which is given before the meeting so that creditors can have a look at it. Mm -hmm. And creditors will have the opportunity to vote. Mm -hmm. So either by uh, the directors of the company or they can appoint proxies to vote on their behalf. Mm -hmm. A case in point was uh, Uchumi because when there was a creditors meeting for Uchumi then guys had to vote. Again, it's become a bit messy mm -hmm. uh, in that as well. But Nakumat, for example, both creditors meetings that were held, the proposals were shot down and people were not opting for it. But unless, until that one year period ran out, is when now the administrator had to go to court and seek extension of time. All right. Yeah. Now, before we wind up, under what circumstances, like a uh, case in point, Amako, under what circumstances that the, peti the petitioner withdrew the petition? Uh, no. A petitioner, of course, being someone who has started a claim against an organization can always withdraw their claim at any time. The headache comes in that once you file the petition to wind up a company or to liquidate a company, to try and defend themselves and to try and safeguard the company, the first thing they do is file for administration. That makes the petition null to some extent. Mm -hmm. It becomes mute. Because now, if administration orders are granted, it means that the petition cannot proceed. You see? Mm -hmm. So you've moved on to another realm now. Because you wanted to tear down the company, the judicial system wants to maintain the company. And when they weigh it on a balance of probabilities, the reasoning of the court is, look, we can't tear it down for your sake only, whereas if we the try and maintain the involved, company, yeah, yeah. it can actually help so many other creditors, mm -hmm. you included to recover the debt that is owed to you. Yeah? So again, when you go to withdraw the matter, you can only withdraw the matter, for example, hypothetically, once you've been paid, or once you've realized your claim against mm. the company. So that be the case? Now, once a company is placed under administration, the administrator cannot unilaterally decide to sort you out and, and not leave the other the guys. Rest. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You see, so it becomes very difficult to try and withdraw the matter. The individuals who had filed, who had, who had commenced the petition against uh, Nakumat are still a part of it, unfortunately. And it is apparent now that the company is going to be wound up, but they, could, they, they can't pull out as of yet because they're still hoping that from whatever will be realized from liquidation, uh, they'll get at least a bit uh, to try and settle part of All their right. claims. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, let's take a very quick break and we shall be back with more news. This week, American businesses based in Kenya raised concern over Kenya's taxation regime, terming it as unpredictable and excessive. The president of America Chamber of Commerce in Kenya, that's Philippine Mtiketi Kiki, um, said the while, that while significant funding is required to meet Kenya's development goals, unpredictable and excessive taxation is robbing businesses of funds needed to reinvest for growth and expansion and makes it impossible possible to plan for the future of the growth. 
She argued that um, increasing the tax base cannot be simply about creating new taxes. She further criticized regulation that is solely for the purpose of increasing tax collection, saying such regulation is short-sighted and um, detrimental to long-term business growth. The business lobby has also called for development of clear and transparent laws through meaningful public-private sector engagement in policy formulation in order to create a predictable policy environment that will enhance investment and improve the business environment. The Amcham president's statement comes against the backdrop of the introduction of turnover tax among other new taxes at the start of this year. Amcham Kenya represents and spearheads the interests of American companies and promotes uh, growth in trade and investment between Kenya and the U.S. Finally, Kiambu County has a new governor. The immediate former deputy governor of Kiambu County, Dr. James Nyoro, was sworn in as the county's third governor following the removal of, of, from office uh, by impeachment of Ferdinand Wondungu Waititu Babayao. Now, Dr. Nyaro's inauguration came two days after Waititu was removed from office after the Senate approved three counts leveled against him for his impeachment by the county government of Kiambu. Now, the three counts included violation of the constitution, violation of national laws, and gross misconduct. Waititu is currently facing a case in court in which he is facing six counts of involvement in the irregular award of a 580 million shillings tender. And that's where we end it on this week's edition of The Big Ten. My name is Nina Shivan. See you next week.